Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Aaron, for that introduction. So my name is Dr. Conor McCormick. I am the CEO and co-founder of a company called MCore Technologies. And this afternoon, I'm going to talk about 3D printing and education and why I believe 3D printing is really going to be the revolution in education that people have been talking about. So the first thing, what does MCore Technologies do? We're an Irish company. We're about 30 minutes up the road. Uh, and we produce the highest quality industrial 3D printer, uh, the prints in full color. So these are parts that come directly out of our 3D printer, everything from prosthetics to product design to art to architecture, uh, from um, you know mobile phones, uh, for, uh, phonetics. Everything here we do, it comes straight out of our iris color printer. Now, we have been in the business over 10 years, so this isn't going to be a party political broadcast about MCOR. I just want to give a little brief background. Uh, we have 100 dealers that we sell around the world with 50 countries. Uh, we've sold to some very big companies throughout the years, and it's all based around a color technology called the MCOR Iris. So if you go to a website, you'll see all the information about the Iris machine. Now, today I'm going to talk about education. So I want to talk a little bit about my own personal timeline. Uh, like, I am not an educator. I am an engineer. Uh, so why do I feel I can talk a little bit about education? So in the old personal timeline, it really all starts back uh, to 1970. So I know you're looking at me here and you probably think that's when I graduated from college, but actually that's when I was born. So I must never have had any hair, uh, but this was me. So really, in 1982, uh, here you can see a picture of myself and my brother. My brother's on the left-hand side, I'm in the middle. Uh, we were mad about building motorbikes. It was always about breaking things down, experimenting, asking the questions all the time, why is this, why is that? And I think now, if we had a 3D printer in those days, it would have been amazing. Um, the first time I ever came across a 3D printer, actually, can I ask a question? Who here has used a 3D printer? Can you raise your hands? So it's maybe about half the audience, which is interesting. And so, believe it or not, 3D printing is over 32 years old. So the very first time I seen a 3D printer was on a show called Tomorrow's World. Some people over this side of the water might remember it. And it was amazing technology where they showed a resin of plastic and a laser coming down and an object growing out of the bat. Um, so this was my first introduction to 3D printing. Uh, from that, I went off and did a degree in mechanical engineering. And in 2000, I got a PhD in the same thing, obviously, from Trinity College. So this is the first time in between those two years that I actually got a chance uh, to do some lecturing, to stand in front of some students and trying to convey a message. So this is the only real bit that I really have of uh, experience with education in those period of time. Post my PhD, I ended up working with Airbus on a big European project. And that really led to the exposure to 3D printing, to us setting up the company. Uh, this happened in 2005, so this was taken at the weekend when we had the idea of building our 3D printer. And like any good startup company, when people talk about in-house machines, it was in the front room of my house. So this is a kind of a personal timeline to where we are today. So the agenda for today, I'm going to talk a little bit about taking a look at education in the past. How have people been educated? Then I'll talk about how has technology been used in education? Next, I'll talk about how I feel that children should be taught and finishing off with examples of how 3D printing can really be used in education to make it happen. So the first thing, let's look back. So this is a very famous uh, painting that was done in 1350. Um, and this is a university in Bologna. And here you can see something that's very interesting. Now, this reminds me of when I was trying to do some lecturing in Trinity College. So here you have a lecturer standing at a pulpit, reading out some sort of a text. Here you have the students at the front of the class being really diligent and taking all the information. At the back, you have the students, some of them trying to get the phone number of somebody, of the, the girl sitting beside them. The guy here was probably out the night before, had too much to drink. And the examiner's here making sure that the lecturer does the right thing. Now, I know this is a bit of a funny, but the, the reality is here, in a lot of universities, it hasn't really changed a lot from this. So, let's look at how children have been taught, and let's talk a little bit about technology in the classroom. So, the very first documented tablet was actually a clay tablet, different than an iPad, 
and that was actually 1800 BC. But if you look at 1750 to 1800, students had their own individual blackboards. Then in 1801, a Scottish teacher uh, came up with this idea, rather than the students having individual blackboards, why don't we have one big blackboard at the top of the class and they can all learn from one blackboard and do their own personal work? In 1905, we had this thing called a stereoscope, where students could actually get engaged with the, with the subject by looking at pictures in stereo. 1980 was the whiteboard everybody's familiar with. Then you had innovations like in 2006, one laptop per child. And now a lot of universities and schools, particularly, are moving into tablets, where the textbooks are going onto tablets. Now, one thing, although technology is coming in here, one thing that's the same, it's still a kind of a 2D image, or it's a 2D problem. You're trying to convey a mathematical problem or something in science or physics. If it's not on the blackboard, it's on a tablet. It is still not physical. It is something still as a student have to, has to comprehend. Some people can, some people can't. So, let's talk about how we think children should be taught. So here's a quote. This is not my quote. But do not train children to learn by force or by harshness, but, but direct them to it by what amuses their minds so that they may be able to discover with accuracy the particular bent of genius of each, and that's from Plato. So if we can direct the children to learning, if we can amuse their minds, you will understand how intelligent or the genius of each individual child. So when you think about it, if you look at all the books about education and you boil it down, I believe there's four kind of key messages, there's four kind of three key things that you need to do. The first one is customized learning. There's lots of documentation that learning is very similar to a production line, and that came about from the Industrial Revolution. You know, children were treated like something on a production line. There was a set course, a set time that they had to learn, and they had to go through the system. Yet children learn at different rates and ch children have a different ability to learn, but every child has the ability to learn. So if you had a customized learning system, that would be much beneficial. Secondly, independent thinking. It sounds obvious, but you need to teach a child to learn how to think and not what to think. So you need to teach them how to break it down and understand the problem and do it themselves. Third, creativity. Creativity is as important as literacy. Creativity is inventing, experimenting, failing faster, breaking things. And then finally, curiosity. If you don't ask why, if a student starts asking the question, why does this happen? When I put this here, why does it go that way? If I put this chemical in here, why does that happen? Curiosity is very, very important. And children are natural learners. If you can light the spark of curiosity in a child, a lot of times they will learn themselves. But that's an important thing. So those four main elements of what I think needs to be included in education. And I think there is one piece of new technology that enables that to happen. And as you can guess by the title of the presentation, I think that's 3D printing. I think 3D printing can do all of these things. And I'll talk a little bit about some examples. So in the maths, uh, math class, everybody here, I assume at one point, would have learned some simple things like Pythagoras' theorem, the sum and the hypotenuse, the square is equal to the sum of the squares on the other two sides and the student learns that like you would, and they have a, an understanding of what that means. But in a simple example of that, you can actually print out Protagoras' theorem, and you can actually see that the squares, it's the size of the squares on the sides, that you can take the squares from the both sides and roll it round onto the hypotenuse and see that it's made up of the sum of the other two squares. Another great example I heard of this, of a father who his daughter was blind, and she had a hard time understanding that one-sixth was smaller than one-third, because six is bigger than three. Yet, she couldn't visualize, you know, like a pizza type of a shape, which is what you would normally show, like a different size of slices from a pie. So we used a 3D printer to actually help her visualize with her fingers, to actually visualize it. Second thing, uh, calculating ratios. I know plenty of engineers have a hard time with this. Um, working out if you rotate this this way, what way will it go? Will it be faster? Will it be slower? Sometimes you think about your bicycle and putting it into the higher or low gear. Yeah, you could imagine a situation where you actually print out those gears for the students in class, and it's spring-loaded gear system, and you can put different size gears, and I can see the ratio from one to the other. So I think the airport learning is better. The students are going to learn a little bit better from that process of being able to actually visualize it and experiment themselves. Uh, geometry. People who do technical drawing might have come across this thing called an apollonial cone. 
Uh, depending on what way you cut it, you're going to get a circle if it's horizontal. You're going to get an ellipse if it's sideways, a parabola, a hyperbola. That's quite difficult stuff to understand. Yet if you could print that whole thing out and let the students actually understand it, oh yeah, that's an ellipse, that's a circle. And you might say, well, what's the benefit of working out what a, what a parabola is? Well, a parabola is the direction that an object follows if you fire it out of a gun. So there's lots of, lots of real-world examples why you might need to know that. So the output is a bit better. So as Irene said earlier, it's not just the typical maths. There's science, but there's also art. But in terms of science, some really amazing things have happened over the last couple of years. The ability to scan objects and to get them onto a computer is now available at a very affordable price, and it's very attainable for everybody. So the Smithsonian, I'd advise anybody to go on to the Smithsonian, they are now going through a process of 3D scanning in all their artifacts so this, if people know anything about uh, aircraft or space, this is called the Bell X-1. And this is a full-scale model of the Bell X-1 that flew to 700 miles per hour, 43,000 feet, in 1947. Now, what's interesting about this aircraft is that it nearly broke up trying to break the sound barrier. This is the first aircraft to break the sound barrier. And the reason why was because of the tail. Was very, there was a lot of instability in the tail. You could imagine now a science class. You could actually download this design, print it out. The students could modify it digitally on the computer, run it through a wind tunnel test, and try and find out their own solution. Another example, bringing the past to life. One of the biggest challenges that history teachers have is trying to get students to engage right now with something that happened in the past. Here's an example of Amelia Earhart's jacket. This is a full 3D scan of her jacket. You could actually print out her jacket have the students actually hold that, even though it's only a copy, but it would look like it. It would look like the 3D printed artifact. Another example would be history. So this is, this is a great one. This is a scan, a life scan, a life mask, should I say, of Lincoln. And in this scan, this was taken in 1860, just before he became president. And he was a very prominent lawyer. Um, and he didn't have time to sit down for the sculptor, so the sculptor said, can we do a life mask? So they did the life mask, and this is what was done, and they made a sculpture from that. But this is interesting, but I think this is even more interesting. And if anybody here is ever thinking about going into politics, this should stop you. This wasn't taken 20 years later, this was taken five years later. So in those five years, not only do you get a chance to see this new mask, but you can see the stress, you can see the strains, you can see the worry lines. And it's been well documented in history that he had a difficult time when he became president. But you can actually see it in the scan, which is interesting. Uh, anthropology. So there's loads of examples where you know, people are now starting to find artifacts and scanning it up. And you can spin it around on your computer and you can look at it, but there's, no, there's nothing that can compare with it actually having it in your hand, actually having that skull and actually looking at it, anthropologists, and say, oh yeah, I can see what happened here. It's very difficult to see that on the screen, whereas you actually just print it out, download, and print it out, and you have it in your hand. So there are lots of examples where uh, people are already using 3D printing, and these are, these are quotes from people who are using 3D printing to try and teach children, and this will kind of show what's really happening. So this is a university, uh, the Western University of Health Science. So the first thing they say is that everyone learns differently. So that's what I talked about earlier, about you know, people, you know, customized learning systems. For this university, it was very important that they understood movement. So you can't really get that from a computer program unless it's a very complex physics, whereas you print them out, you can actually understand that quite easily. And finally, 3D printing is only a tool for learning. A big mistake that people make is that they think, I'll just buy a 3D printer and everything's going to be golden. Well, the reality is it's just a tool. It needs to be incorporated into the curriculum. It needs to be worked at to make it happen. Other examples, Lee High School, engaging students in a meaningful way. So this is, the, again, going back to the idea of curiosity and creativity, trying to engage with the students and get them to understand and to break things and to test. The Art Centre of College, Pasadena, they have a great line, learn to create and influence change. So the students are learning to create data, learn to create new objects, and then they use that learning to actually create change, and it's like an iterative process that rolls over from next thing to the next thing. So in summary, with 27 seconds left, um, I really do believe that children should be taught by creating an environment of customized learning, as I mentioned, the four things, independent thinking, creativity, and curiosity. I passionately believe that 3D printing is able to do all of that. It'll make it better in all of those things. It'll enable it to happen. 
It is a slow process potentially, but it will definitely take place. So I really do think that 3D printing and education is, is a revolution waiting to happen. Please, thank you for, for your attention today. Go visit our website, MCore Technologies, and uh, thank you very much.